Good morning. Good morning. I want to thank all of you for being here. <laughs> Some of you found out I was coming, and uh, um, you decided to show up anyway. <laughs> Somebody I ran into the football game yesterday said, I hear you're, you're preaching tomorrow at Poland Presbyterian Church. I said, yeah. And he said, I understand they just reinforced the walls of the church this last month. <laughs> anyway, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I'd like to start out with uh, a short prayer before we begin with the scripture. Let us pray. Oh God, by your spirit, tell us what we need to hear and show us what we ought to do to obey Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Today I chose, uh, it's actually from the lectionary, the scripture lesson today, and um, it's from Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 to 44. Now before I do this reading, I just want to do a little bit of background to tell you that if you've read this in the previous chapter, Matthew ended with the reference to the destruction of the temple and the second coming of Christ. So later on in chapter, uh, or in chapter 24, Jesus predicts that uh, the temple is going to be destroyed, and, but his disciples have two questions for him. When will this occur? And second, what will be the sign of your return to bring about your kingdom? So keep that in mind as I read this uh, verse from Matthew. I'll be reading the version from the New International uh, Edition. Listen for the word of the Lord. But about that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, People were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah, Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So also must you be ready, because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. So. If you came today thinking of, that I deliver some fire and brimstone, that's not going to happen. Because usually when I do something like that, I'm the one who winds up getting burnt. So. But today is a special season in the church. It's the first day of Advent. And it's supposed to be the time of joy, anticipation, and celebration. But in my life, I always get a little depressed about this time of year. In fact, I said these words to my wife the other day, and of course, she wasn't happy with me. I said, bah, humbug. <laughs> and I guess the reason I get that way is because we start out the season with all this crass, crass commercialization. I don't know if you notice, it started right around before Halloween. It seems like it's getting earlier and earlier every year. So each year, this time season, I always try to remind myself of an unexpected opportunity that occurred to me several years ago. And every time I think of this, it turns my season not only to joy, but a season of blessing. Years ago, I teach at the university and I got a semester's leave. I went to Austin, Texas, back to the laboratory where I earned my PhD to do some research. And this was in the fall and I remember that it, my wife had come to visit me, and I'd just taken her back to the airport and had decided I needed to get some breakfast. 
And so I drove to a McDonald's in town, and it was a cold morning. It was in the mid to low 30s. And if you've been to Austin, Texas, mid to low 30s in Austin, Texas is like the blizzard here in Ohio. I mean, it's cold. So as I drove into the parking lot, I noticed on the right, sitting in the pile of dirt, was a young man. Disheveled, had dirt on his face. He had gloves without the fingers in them. And he was sitting in the dirt doing something with his hands. And you've been there, too. You see somebody who's poor and obviously homeless. And what do we do? We drive right on by. Don't we think about it, but we drive on by. So I parked, went into McDonald's. It was very crowded that morning. And I'm standing in line, and pretty soon this young man comes in, and he stands in the line next to me. And I'm looking at him, and, you know, it's obvious. He's down on his luck. And he's in his 20s, early 20s. It's a very sad situation. I'm watching him. We each move up to the line. I order my breakfast, you know, breakfast sandwich, hash browns, and a large coffee. And I'm standing there waiting for my food to come when he walks up to the counter. And he asks for a single breakfast taco, $1. And what he has in his hands is change. That's all he has. And he lays it down on the counter. And the lady who's taking his order starts going through the coins, counting and make sure he has exactly one dollar. Now, you can imagine these coins aren't exactly pristine, correct? And she finds this coin that has a little bit of mud on it. And I'll never forget her look of disgust as she's counting this money and she flicks away the penny that has mud on it, flicks it onto the floor, doesn't even want to touch it. I was angry. I get my food and I go sit down. Pretty soon this young man comes out with his single taco and some ketchup packages. And he sits at a tall table and begins to eat his lowly breakfast taco, no drink, just a breakfast taco. And he's taking a nibble of it, dips it in the ketchup, takes a nibble of it, sets it down, and is sitting there chewing on his nibble while watching TV. And people are ignoring him. And I'm sitting watching this, this young man who obviously is starving to some extent, homeless, dirty, disheveled. And I'm getting angrier and angrier, looking around all these people with all their bounty in front of them. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore. I finished my breakfast sandwich, walked up, refilled my coffee, walked over to the young man, and set my coffee cup in front of him and said, this is for you. And by the way, I found this on the floor next to you. It must be yours. And I laid down a $20 bill right in front of him. And I walked out. And as I was walking out, the young man said, Oh my God, oh my God, thank you, sir. God bless you. I will never forget that. An unexpected opportunity in which I was blessed. It still gets to me today when I think about it. That's how today's scripture kind of speaks to me. Jesus, rather by than dwelling on the answers to his disciples' questions, says, well, let me tell you how you ought to live, rather than worrying about what's going to happen. So Jesus provides four answers to them in the, in the passages that follow. First, take every precaution not to be taken in by false prophets. Because he predicts the temple is going to fall, he knows that others will come along and claim to be the new savior. He tells them to beware. Second, he says, don't be alarmed by all the tribulations, the wars and the infighting and everything that's going to happen. That's just part of what happens in life. Don't be afraid. Third, remain faithful in the midst of all these trials and tribulations knowing that those who endure will receive salvation. And finally, he says, be ready. 
Watch, because at any moment Christ will return. <coughs> By watching, he says, it's essential because no one knows when he's coming back. So the question is, despite all the answers, how do we live? How do we be ready? Jesus later on in several passages later tells some parables. And one of the parables he talks about is the parable of the talents. And to summarize that, the parable suggests that readiness involves active service to your fellow man. Christians who refuse to use their gifts for God, he says, will encounter an angry judgment. So he's telling his disciples to prepare themselves for the second coming by doing good to those in need. And in that way, they will be judged. The last day, they will unknowingly encounter Christ in the persons that are poor and needy. So, what Christ says, he says so well in Matthew 25, verse 45. Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. I think that's the true message of Advent. To be ready and to do others what is right, what is good. That way, you're not only watching, but you're being ready for the second coming of Christ. And that's what gives me hope and cheer during this season. Not the receiving, not the bright lights, the glitz, the decorations. Rather, I believe it is incumbent upon all of us to be ready for those blessings when unexpected opportunities appear before us. Opportunities to reach out in the act of service of Christ. I believe that this is just not an Advent opportunity, by the way. I think it should be all year round. Because we never know when Christ is coming. It doesn't have to be an Advent. Any time of year. So the message I'd like to leave with you today is, indeed, be watching and waiting for those blessings of unexpected opportunities. And in that way, not only will you serve Christ, but you'll be ready for his coming. You'll be ready when you will be taken away. Thanks be to God. Amen.